All right, we have returned to open session of the combined school committee meeting of June 21st, 2017. Paul. So, as, as discussed and approved in executive session, I move for the region that we approve the amended Superintendent Northborough Southboro Public Schools District Contract of Employment uh, with major feature includes a 3.2% cost of living allowance in year one, as well as the other adjustments to the contract as noted inside the executive session meeting. It's long, okay. sorry. Second. That's fine. Moved by Paul Buckus, seconded by Lynn. Mary Beth. Um, so moved for Southboro and the Union. Mary Beth moves for Southboro and the Union. Second for Southboro. Mm. Second for the Union. Seconded by Roger for Southboro, seconded by Jerry for the Union. So moved for Northboro. Moved by Joan for Northboro. Seconded, seconded for Seconded by Keith for Northboro. Second move for them. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we're good. No, we're all, we're all set, we're right? All, set. all right. Any other uh, questions, discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the amended contract? Oh, does it have to be roll call? I think it has to be roll call. It has to be oh, roll yeah. call. Well, well, right. Well. Roll call. Yes. 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 A resounding yes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Nice congratulations. Danielle, this was a long night. Well deserved. Well deserved. Junk. I make a motion to adjourn for Northboro. All right, moved by Joan, seconded by Keith. Motion to adjourn for Southboro. Motion to adjourn by South, to Southboro for Southboro by Roger. A mo motion to adjourn for the union. M Mary Beth moves for the union. Now second Southboro in the union. And seconded by Jerry for both Southboro and the union. And Regent is going to stay in session. All right. All yeah. those in favor? Yes. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Please, let us go. <laughs> Uh, yeah. are adjourned. Five of nine. Wow. All right. And region, the first thing we're doing is moving it's to going to executive session. Okay. Really? So. Yes. I have to. I have to. Oh, can I get it? Absolutely. Yeah. I have to. They're in a pile. Of so I move for the re for the region. We're, that's the only one in session. <laughs> that we move to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining due to the chair's determination that a discussion regarding this matter in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the position of the committee with the intent to return to open meeting when we're done. Okay. Seconded by. Second. 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 Oops. Seconded by Jones. Moved by Paul. Bucket. Seconded by Jones. This is a roll call. Yes. 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 Sorry. yes. All right. In we the have executive enough. session, yeah, we go. No. We're tied. Nope. No, we're never went out of session, regular session. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I dabbled us back in combined. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think you do. I don't know. Uh, you know what? Use it. No use harm it. in dabbling. Go ahead. Go ahead. Smack. Smack. Well, we're going to use it. Okay. We are back. <laughs> okay. We are back in open session after executive session. Um, so we're changing the agenda around? Uh, we're going to change the agenda around a bit. So if it is the will of the committee, uh, what we would like to do is, because there are people in the audience that have been waiting very patiently and don't need to watch us talk about this. So I would propose that we move new business uh, up to the top of the agenda, yeah. if, that, if everyone is mm -hmm. sure. so inclined to agree. OK, good. Then let us do that. And We'll go right into new business and the school improvement plan update. Mr. Mayor, long awaited. <coughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And final presentation of his school improvement plan. That's right. So I'm joined by two members of our school council, um, Spisha Geigas, um, who's a cast member here, a teacher um, in our school, and Ed Weiser. Ed Weiser is um, a parent in our community. Um, but he's also a teacher at Brookline High School. So um, they've joined me tonight to give you an overview of the school improvement plan, particularly the um, changes, the additions, the um, adjustments that we've made mid-course, so to speak, in this particular two-year plan. So um, with that, I think we can get started. And uh, we'll start with you, Spisha, oh, talking about you. a few things. OK. So you're in goal number one, is that goal right? Goal number one. OK. Um, one of the things that um, I'm sorry, 
start up this year is the Writing Center at Algonquin. Um, and it was set, started up by Sarah Stein and Seth um, Zarnecki. And um, it's, um, this is the second semester that it's been running. Um, the first semester, um, it was at an after school thing from two days a week. And the second semester, it, um, they opened up a few spots during the day and where students can go in. And it was run by tutors who were students. And the students um, took an advanced writing class and, in order to be trained for this. And in the fall, there were 23 students who took the advanced class. And in the spring, there were 18 students. Um, so that's the writing center. Um, the second thing that goal number two, goal number one, is the LMS, can, um, we're going to be um, implementing the Canvas system. Um, and the students are really excited about this. Um, it's a great way to, for them to learn different things. Um, and it's a management system that has a grade book and it will replace Edline. Um, and teachers have been piloting this this past year and with great results and next and teachers have gone through different training during the school year and we'll be ready to start it next year. So if I might um, step in here, we're looking at, still at uh, goal number one, which is of course faculty and staff support. Um, uh, activity number five talks about enhancing upper school student familiarity with careers and work. Um, what we've been doing in that regard is a host of different things, but notably, um, seven years ago we started a um, science career day. And by that we brought in uh, parents and uh, others in the local community who were involved in careers in science. And they talked um, <coughs> to classes in an organized way, um, wholly within the structure of the science courses, so there was no loss of instruction time in any of the other topics and the other, other content areas, but um, that's been going on strong for seven years now. And what we decided was, um, heck, that's good enough pilot for us, let's try something else. So we did a, a math career day um, just this past June 5th. Um, we did our math career day, the first one, and uh, with equal results in the sense that um, we had uh, parents, again, who are um, working in fields and professions related to mathematics and they came in and talked to uh, our students again about their careers, their pathways to those and in some cases how confused they were as high school students. So a great deal of relevance and, and uh, a, a, a really good invitation to our students to engage with them in terms of asking questions and that sort of thing and that usually um, triggers um, questions. So our plans for this are to expand it even further. We have about three different departments who raised their hands and said, yes, we'll do a career day too. So we'll make a, a choice on that next year, presumably. And um, you know, again, add to what we think is very, a very good thing that we're doing in terms of coordinating and organizing um, visitors that come into our school that talk about their careers in different fields. So CASA. Okay. Do you want to talk about uh, goal number two and uh, activity one? Okay, sure. Um, CASA is the um, Cultural Ambassador Student Association, um, which was before, uh, under a different name, Diversity Awareness, and that's run by Nikki Rufo. Um, and it educates students on the diversity in, in the community, um, whether it's a religious or an ethnic diversity. And they do a lot of different events. One of the things that they did right before um, the carnival this year is they had a diversity show, um, which the whole school part um, was able to go watch. Um, another thing that they do is they do something that Nikki calls carnival, and it's, um, it's outside of the cafeteria. And they try to spread the word as to what the um, group is about, and they do food, and they have pamphlets. Um, and they did a tie-dye thing this year to get kids involved in it. Um, next year, they're planning a trip to um, the African American Museum in Boston and a trip to New York City. So um, they want to get a lot of kids involved. 
and one of the other things that they were going to do is like the members of the group, um, they're going to have like you bring a friend along so to include more kids to get involved in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, another area that um, in goal number two, um, this is activity number four, provide a safe, effective learning environment for students uh, with physical slash mental health issues to transition into full school um, population. And um, <clears throat> we have two programs that are specifically geared around that. One is our RISE program, which has been uh, ongoing for about uh, six, seven years now. But new to the uh, options that we have is the ACCESS program. Um, and our access program is, is possible by a grant that we received through the Metro West Health Foundation. And uh, we have basically a three-year uh, grant uh, that we're working on um, with the hopes of um, establishing uh, a very effective program, again, designed to hasten and uh, quicken our students' return to full-time status as students after they have suffered some sort of a setback um, in the access program. It's often a physical setback, such as a concussion or um, surgery of some sort or that sort of thing. Whereas in the past, we have, um, these students have really stayed home. Um, we've provided tutoring services, that sort of thing. But we didn't think that was all in all very effective in terms of allowing our students to keep up with what's going on in class. So by bringing them back into the building physically, even if it's for just a short time during each day, um, it's, a better, it's a better option for them. Um, interestingly, um, the access program is modeled um, on programs that have been already in existence around um, the Boston area. And one of the leading um, schools in this is Brookline. So here's Ed. He's going to talk a little <laughs> bit about, <laughs> about um, the program that um, they have at their school because they're a year or two ahead of us in terms of what's what they've done. Yeah, briefly, I've, um, we've been doing it for a long time. There's been a, a there are definitely some issues that we we know that are hard to work around in terms of bringing a student back to the way that school is regularly done, and those those same issues are definitely uh, being worked on here at uh, Algonquin. But it was really nice to see that. You know, there's a lot of outreach to other districts to try to figure out how to solve this very difficult problem, especially with um, a lot of concussions that we have to deal with as well, and trying to bring students back into the classroom that way. Okay. So um, Brookline, Algonquin, and I think there's four or five other schools that are part of this uh, consortium of schools that are all doing basically the same thing. And, um, you know, we are tied together by the grant process through the Metro West Health Foundation. And we just um, underwent a site visit um, that sort of was an audit of our program. So I was uh, spoken to. We had a conversation. But also, everybody that works in the program, either directly or on the periphery of it, um, a lot of people were interviewed on that program, too. So um, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, a thoroughly qualified and uh, bona fide member of this organization, which is great because, as, as Ed says, you know, it's great to be a uh, collaborator with other schools and to learn from other schools in terms of how they do things um, successfully. So um, um, we have access. Um, we, uh, looking at activity number five in that goal, just briefly, the Metro West Health Risk Survey. We finally did get the results of that. Um, we are um, poised, I think, to uh, analyze those results rather fully at the beginning of next year um, and um, you know, take advantage of the new class coming in, the renewed energy that comes with the school in September, um, to look at the results of the Metro West Health Survey. We did have um, a sneak peek at that um, a little bit earlier this year. I think it was in early May when we got our re results from the summary of those, of those findings. Um, very interesting um, uh, look at things. Uh, if you're familiar with that format, they, they analyze uh, risk responses um, that students make across gender, so boys and girls. They look across uh, age groups, 
um, so nine through 12 um, in the school. Um, they also look um, at school to school, so we can compare our school versus the rest of the schools. So there's 22 schools in total, high schools, that participate in the survey. So we get the benefit of looking at a particular data in a, in a few different cuts, um, which is good. And again, it's something that uh, the school will sink its teeth into um, come the start of next year. Can I ask you just a quick, do they do year over year as well? The, 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 the survey, does it show here's where we were three years ago, here's where we were two years yes. ago? Yeah, okay. Yes, we do have the benefit now of longitudinal <coughs> data. Okay because we started this in 2010, and so they do it every other year, so we had 10, 12, 14, and now 16. Super. So that's great to have that yeah, kind so, of track yeah, record. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, number eight, the activity there is investigate options and alternatives for later start time. This is a recurring uh, theme <laughs> and um, a lively topic. Um, and one of the things I think that we've uh, understood is that the particular challenge that a regional school has is somewhat unique in terms of trying to solve this. Um, solving it would be to move the start time. Um, so one uh, recent development that I've noticed that um, will probably help us a little bit is the Lincoln Sudbury School District <coughs> has also undertaken this as, as a topic. So therein lies maybe some potential liaison, if you will, or, or sharing of, of information with, um, you know, a district that's close by and also looking at this that also uh, is up against that same challenge that the regional schools have uh, around transportation. So again, we thought that that bore, you know, a good reason for including it in this in the uh, school improvement plan. So where are we, Counselor? Three? Okay. <coughs> that sounds good. Okay. okay. Um, goal three, um, unified team development. Um, currently, Algonquin um, has a unified track team, and this has been going on for about six years now. Um, and a track team is for um, students with and without intellectual disabilities. And not only do we do that, but we also partner up with Westboro. So the two schools combine, come together, and make up one team. Um, and it's a great um, opportunity for kids to shine um, and help their peers. Um, two years ago, we started a unified basketball team here um, with great success. Um, for, it was a pilot program. And we had 25 students that wanted to be part of the program. Um, basketball team can have that many students in, mm -hmm. but we worked it out and they all had a great time. Last year we ended up getting, actually this past year, we ended up getting a grant from Special Olympics. Um, I think it was about $1,000. And we had a great program this year. Um, we had, we had, we cut it down to, I'd say about 20 students. So we need to cut it down again for next year. And um, we just filled out an application to do this again for next year. So it's a great program. Thank you, Spisha. Um, activity six um, mentions event support. Um, our school is uh, constantly putting on one event after another. Um, we do have the benefit um, of the Worcester State cohort. We have a number of, of teachers. I think we have eight teachers in that program who are interested in gaining their certification in supervision and uh, um, principalship, assistant principalship, and so on. So um, they're in the midst of that cohort, and uh, in the coming year, they will be required to uh, do uh, an abundance of hours, um, and we're looking at that as uh, a mother load of, of effort um, that can uh, be elicited out of, out of the eight um, uh, individuals that are in that program. So. We're looking forward to that in, in, a, in a lot of ways, event support, um, you know, in terms of, of helping us to not only run events, but also to um, make some effective use of uh, feedback and that sort of thing so that we can make uh, improvements to our different events that we do. So um, that's gonna be a big help to us to, as a school as a whole um, to do that. 
Um, the last thing there on, uh, that we'd like to kind of mention is the International Student Exchange, just an update on that. Uh, we're now looking at, I think, three students possibly uh, to come to our school next year. Um, one from Spain, one from China, and one from Vietnam. Um, so um, we're looking forward to that. We're also keeping the doors open, hoping that we might um, attract a couple more students. We'd like to get to about five students or so in that program. But um, good, good um, early um, returns, if you will, on that, and uh, we're looking forward to hosting those students. Um, and just uh, down to goal number, goal number five. Um, again, this is having to do with attracting and nurturing community support. Um, Obviously, we do a lot of activities and events um, out in uh, the towns of Northboro and Southboro. That goes on, that continues. Um, these are things that we do with the senior centers or the social clubs. Um, we work from time to time with the town offices on different kinds of projects, too. Um, but uh, we also um, enjoy the great generosity of the Ed Foundations in both towns, Northboro and Southboro. And, um, um, their support for Algonquin has been remarkable and, and consistent over the years, so we really appreciate that. Um, it's part of my job to try to encourage our teachers to apply for these uh, grants because, uh, you know, again, the generosity and the funding power of these ed foundations is significant and growing, so that's a terrific thing, and that helps us um, across the board. But it also encourages teachers to take the initiative um, to um, ask for those sorts of things that will help their classroom and help their students. So that's that. Um, that's essentially it. It's a quick tour through the um, school improvement plan. There's a 16-page uh, copy that you have uh, on that that's all been updated. Um, in my experience here, this has been probably the, the most um, uh, enthusiastic effort on the part of the parents, the teachers, and the students. Um, so I really, really appreciate um, what they were able to do. Um, they're very, very um, interested in doing everything they can to sort of help the school. Um, uh, Jackie Barnes was the uh, author of this um, concept of having a quick sheet, a uh, kind of a Hmm. Maybe we don't say it in the schools too much, but it's a cheat sheet. You know, <laughs> it's, a way of, it's a way of kind of summarizing in a quick way uh, what we've been doing in the um, bigger document, the 16-page document. But my great thanks to Spisha and Ed for joining me tonight to talk about this. But we um, certainly will entertain any questions that you might have. I have, uh, I have well, one, I just want to comment on the Frank, the cheat sheet's a terrific idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're able to get through an awful lot of material in a very short period of time. The, the, uh, on the access, um, there's mentioned here there's a grant compliance site visit this month. Mm -hmm. so, so the money that you get the, on the grant, I mean, is that mostly to like transport kids that are hurting or, you know, back and forth to school or, or do they have special transportation needs that that we have to honor as part of the access program? That would only be really a minor part. I think the, the basic um, um, heft of the grant, if you will, yep. uh, goes to um, uh, helping us to uh, source um, personnel for the, for the program. So I know one of our positions is largely funded specifically by the grant. We have two positions. We have an adjustment counselor and a tutor um, for this program. and. Um, the other is um, for materials. Um, so we have an account for materials that comes through the grant that helps us to bring in special kinds of materials that might be uh, of, of assistance to students that need um, some, they have a physical disability temporarily um, perhaps, right. but nevertheless a disability that prevents them from may maybe accessing or, or being in the classroom, that sort of thing. So that's, that's where a lot of that money goes. How many kids at a, at a time, or, I'm sorry, just as a follow-up, are, are on the are in access program at any one point in time? Is it it's, just it's a couple? It's usually or? between five and ten or so, and it, it varies in that regard. Uh, it, it, it 
you know, between those numbers, but our throughput last year was 29. Um, we got 29 students through in our first year of operation, and um, we're sort of, you know, our, our year started in January, so we have to look uh, January through December, and then that's a full year for us, so we had 29 there. We're on pace to probably um, slightly um, um, have a few more students than that this year. Um, at the midway point, we're about at 17 students. So again, if, if that holds, then we'll probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 31 or 32 students going through. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I have two areas. Uh, the first one is the unified team. Mm -hmm. uh, was it just basketball that we have that team, the unified team? We have both track and, bas and basketball. Track. Track's been going on for about six years, um, and this was the second season for basketball. Okay. Suspicious the coach. <laughs> <laughs> and does, do those teams fall under the auspices of the athletic department? Yes. They do. Okay. And uh, my only suggestion on that is, and I think it's wonderful that you went to get a grant to help the, in the funding it, I would also suggest going to the Northboro Ed Foundation and the Southboro Ed Foundation okay. because they also give grants to Algonquin and you might be able to get two, you know, in one great. year. So that'd be one wonderful. That's a great idea. And then the other one was on these exchange students. Uh, <coughs> do we have the uh, families already set up for these three or are we still just in the process of working out the applications? Well, we, we work um, uh, in advance of that with um, both of our, we, we're working currently with two agencies, the Cambridge Institute and also CIEE. And both of them have programs for recruiting uh, host families. So, um, and that requires us to do our part, which is to talk to our communities about their interest in mm. being a host family. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, I, I post that out from time to time um, through one calls to our community about um, people that might be interested in being a host family. Okay, and will these be like the Cambridge one where it was only a one year exchange? Will this be still one year if we do through CII? Yeah, that's generally what um, all these programs are. They're one year programs. Okay. Um, sometimes they're half year, but, but most, most often they're full year programs, but how did the, just for a year. How did the current exchange student we have, how was that year? That was a full year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how did that, how did this go for this it, year? It went very well. Did it? It did. There were some early, early um, changes around the host family arrangement, um, which um, the agency was very helpful in coordinating that. Um, ultimately, um, things settled down rather quickly for our student, which we were thankful for because, um, you know, we don't, we don't want our students to be troubled by things and when you're, 8,000 miles away from home, you know, it's, it's a daunting sort of thing. But um, Jessie did very well. Um, she was inducted into um, the uh, Math Honor Society in this very room. And um, that's the first induction group that we've ever had. So she was a part of that. Um, but she was also active in other uh, extracurricular activities too. So um, she did very well. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you for staying in the, for your volunteer on the school council. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. There's a ton of work, clearly, that has gone into this and continues to go into it. And a ton of people, I'm sure, that you know, just spend countless hours. So thank you very, very much for everything that you contributed. Okay. We're still on new business and district treasurer report and appointment. Well, we are very fortunate and excited to have uh, Christine Tigg still with us. She's patiently um, been waiting back there. Um, we had mentioned when Christine joined us in January as our new district treasurer, newly appointed, that she would be providing an update on her experiences in the district since coming, um, since joining us in January. and. Um, since she's here this evening, she's been investigating OPEB, and uh, we had an occasion to have a great conversation at the regional subcommittee meeting, I think it was last week, uh, where um, a lot of this information that she's gonna share this evening was discussed. Um, and then as a final um, piece to this, uh, I'm sure that uh, once you learn of all of what she's been doing since January uh, to move our district forward, particularly here at the regional level, um, as regional district treasurer, um, you'll, um, 
entertain uh, my recommendation to uh, appoint, to reappoint Ms. Stegg for the next school year, 17, 18, but that will come. And so I, I just wanted to say that before I forget mm -hmm. with the lateness of the hour. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the table. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, since it's so late, I will keep my comments as brief as possible. Um, during the past five months, uh, I've met with many individuals uh, as the district treasurer to ensure a cohesive, transparent relationship throughout the transition. Oh, I've met with our fiscal advisor, David Eisenhall. He is responsible primarily with the bar any borrowing needs we may have. I've met with Stacy Johnson. She's our rep when it comes to the depository accounts with Unibank. Tom Scanlon, who is the principal on the uh, audit for the uh, regional district, and Clifton Lawson and Allen. I'm still getting familiar with all these names. <laughs> um, John, John Sullivan is a principal with them. Uh, I've also participated in discussions with them concerning uh, modules as it relates to accounts receivable, uh, accounts receivable module, which we are hoping to implement sometime in September. I've also participated, uh, my, my past experience is with Budget Sense, so I'm pretty familiar with the whole financial uh, structure that exists. I've established relationships with both state and federal agencies. I've been in communication with the Internal Revenue Service as it re uh, relates to reporting responsibilities year ending quarterly. Uh, I've also, we also have meetings every week with the business administrator and the superintendent to ensure that there's a constant flow of uh, open dialogue between the three different areas of responsibility. One of the primary accomplishments, uh, we've had several accomplishments in the last five months, and I'd also like to share with the school committee that the central office finance staff, um, from my experience, um, is very, very, they're thoughtful, they're, they're dedicated employees, and I really do enjoy working with them all. They've been extremely helpful you know, in all instances, even if I'm only the regional treasurer with anything to deal with the central office, and I thank everyone. But we've implemented pos positive pay, which basically is a payment control mechanism for both pay payable and accounts payable. It, uh, it allows us to monitor and reject payments for inconsistencies, such as the payee, the amount, the date. If anything is wrong, it is rejected until we approve it that particular day by 11 o'clock. So far, we've only had one inconsistency and it really wasn't an inconsistency. It was the signature was too far up on the, the check, so it was bounced back. In today's world, I think, uh, you know, this technology is a s significant plus for the district. We've also min migrated all our local depository accounts to a, v a Vita Bank um, for school lunch deposits, uh, student activity deposits, that happened in March. So we're well on our way there. Um, recently, the food service audit uh, indicated that we need separate uh, depository accounts for food service because of federal monies that are involved. And I've opened up those accounts, separate accounts, for both Unibank and Avita Bank, and we'll start that July, effective July 1st, just to be responsive to the audit. The most significant accomplishment I <coughs> feel, though, is the redo of the Treasurer's cash book. Uh, historically, the, the previous uh, process was antiquated. And this new process is more in line with the tre Treasurer Collectors Association of uh, Reconciliation. And it was established by the guides of the association. The previous method, as I indicated, was antiquated. I think I'd still be working on the reconciliation <laughs> for December if we hadn't changed it. The, the school committee obviously signs off on all expenditures for payroll and accounts payable. 
Uh, these transa transactions should mirror the bank statements, and the only differences should be deposit timing differences in deposits and outstanding checks and voided checks, um, because that's what the, sc the school committee is signing off on. And this is the process by which um, we have a better handle on rec a more efficient and effective manner in which we're reconciling our general books to our bank statements. As we look forward to year end, uh, we will be involved, the central office staff collectively, in closing out the books, reconciling all the bank statements to the general books. And once all of that has, has happened, as the treasurer, I will assist in the ND certification process, hopefully to have um, year-end uh, results in your September meeting. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a bit in, from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Paul. So I have one. Uh, uh, just the, that treasurer reconciliation book change that you, that you just mentioned that you made, has, has Tom Scanlon kind of gone over those? They've procedures blessed, and stuff, they've blessed uh, all that. They've blessed that, as well as um, the other firm that's consulting. Okay, Lawson. terrific. Thank you very much. Clifton, Lawson. Clifton and Lawson. And, and now, quite frankly, and now, um, <laughs> it's more in line because we have separate bank accounts for payroll AP. It really is more in line with how the bank statements should be reconciled. Um, and they have blessed it. So that's Super. the good news. Any other questions? Oh. I can make a motion to reappoint Ms. Christine Tag to the district treasurer for the 2017-2018 school year. Second. Moved by Paul Becker, seconded by Joan. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Oh, boy. Thank, you. Thank you. Nicely done. Um, just briefly, I'll speak about OPEB. Um, superintendent had asked because of some experiences I've had in my previous uh, districts. <laughs> To, to evaluate the options for OPEB. OPEB is basically other post-retirement benefits created as a result of retirees. Your current liability, which is currently going under another, another review as required by statute, is $10.7 million. And that's anticipated to grow over the next several years unless changes are made. Most communities, as well as school districts, regional school districts, um, have not established any kind of funding mechanisms. The one that, the one communities or regional school districts that have are, they have dedicated streams of revenue um, outside of assessments to the towns. For example, the town of Plainville is utilizing the gambling proceeds uh, hmm. from their casino that was recently implemented to fund their OPEP, <coughs> one-time revenue stream. Uh, I'm not really too aware of any regional district um, that's set up the, uh, any mechanism for addressing this at this stage. We had discussion at my Dover Sherburne Regional School District budget uh, at, during the budget process, but again, it came back to is really an assessment back to the two towns if you don't have a dedicated um, revenue stream. So as a result, there are three options. One is an OPEP, OPEP trust uh, fund, which is established under Mass General Law uh, 32B, Section 20, I believe. That is a very complex and costly pr program that you would only implement if you had a dedicated funding source because it is costly. And I would like to look into the options of the cost, for example, a trust would have to be written by an attorney as far as, you know, the irrevocable needs of the trust, et cetera. And also the trustee fees that you would pay and where's the break even point. So I'd like to approach that throughout the next couple of months to have a recommendation for the school committee in September. This, all, the next two options as well as the trust all require an annual town meeting approval after a majority vote by school committee of the district. The next one is um, Mass General Law, Chapter 40, I believe it's um, Section 55B, allows for municipalities and districts to, to establish multiple stabilization funds. I originally was leaning towards that as a, as a recommendation to school committee. 
However, upon further investigation with um, uh, our bond council as well as um, DESE, it was determined the statute itself is ambiguous. However, DESE is saying it does require annual town meeting, annual town meeting vote to establish, but also annual, annual town meeting as well to utilize the funds. So I wouldn't recommend that from a flexibility mm -hmm. perspective to the school committee. The last option is, you're probably familiar with it, it's uh, chapter 71, uh, sex, section 16 G and a half, and it allows the school committee upon town meeting approval to uh, put money into a stabilization fund through a appropriation during the general budget process. Uh, once the fund has been established, school committee can utilize the proceeds of that fund for whatever purposes without just a majority vote with school committee. Um, the beauty of that particular pro um, section allows school committee to put that money into the fund and at some point can transfer that money into the trust fund. So there's mm -hmm. flexibility there if you have a very particular good year, you can actually transfer it into the trust fund from the stabilization fund. So it adds a little bit of um, commitment to the, from the town's perspective, in my opinion. So I would recommend that as the option with addition to establishment of a trust fund through the 19 budget process. Mm -hmm. So. So this is the item we talked about it during budget planning. We right. need some fancy Originally words. Originally I was proposing yeah. chapter 40, but it doesn't give the school committee uh, flexibility. I mean, I don't think you need, do we need a motion? We need a motion. No, no. You're the, you're the treasurer. You tell us what the right well, options I mean, are. And we'll the motion them. would come uh, during the budget process. Right. I would put money in the budget process as a budgeted line item. Um, as well as have the vote to establish the stabilization yep. fund for the school committee, which then would go to town meeting. Okay. Lynn. Um, so just to, um, to clarify, the trust would, would be something that we would do down the road because it's costly. We might, maybe either we have a discover <laughs> manna from heaven and have a stream. <laughs> Uh, revenue stream or we built the stabilization fund up to a level that we could um, establish the trust fund it would make sense when you could establish the trust fund without funding it um, and having no investments you wouldn't incur the incur those fees okay so we could do that you, you know at, at the, the same time, time. Mm -hmm. um, but we would have to establish, we'd have some legal fees when it comes to the establishment and wording right. of the actual trust. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we could do that. Okay, okay, sounds like. And the last, last but not least, <laughs> I know it's been a long night. One of the options when I first came in, we met with David, uh, our fiscal advisor, and he was recommending uh, looking at an advanced refunding. But unfortunately, we're already past that timetable. And advanced refunding allows you to call your bonds prior to the 10-year call. You have to put the money in escrow, and you can't have arbitrage. And the savings is minimal compared to a regular refunding, which we will be looking at for the FY19 budget process. And that's basically calling the bonds. Uh, the estimate he provided us with, um, based on the current rate environment was a potential savings of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars cool given the rate environment we're going to look at that again in november and come to school committee with the results of that cool. thank you thank, thank you. you you have been You're busy mm -hmm. and we appreciate it oh, thank you <laughs> and thank you very much for staying so late <laughs> thank you very much and it's really a pleasure to work here what a cupcake. <laughs> to the road. <laughs> We're going to be eating in the dark in 15 minutes. I know. Minutes. All right. Still staying in new business. We are on to athletics update. Pick a letter. Pick a letter.
go out. Tom, what time do the lights go out? 10 or 11? I think 11. Too. Okay, we have plenty of time. He's cruising the cupcakes. <laughs> I don't think you want to see half of a slide, so let's try this again. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to speak to you about impact uh, information and some concussion data for the 2016-17 school year. So just a little refresher, and I'm sure we're all aware because concussions are at the forefront, but a concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury. It's a, a bump, a blow, or a jolt to the head that causes your brain to move back and forth quickly. And what are some of the symptoms and signs of concussions? They can range from a mild concussion to a very severe concussion. You can have headache, you can have dizziness, you can have um, lack of concentration. The more severe cases of a concussion might be nausea, um, inability to concentrate for long periods of time. So, and no two concussions are the same. So the type of symptoms that, that any student athlete is gonna be uh, experiencing is very uh, different for, for each student athlete or for anyone who experiences a concussion. So in our ARHS Guide to Athletics, if a student athlete sustains a concussion, there are certain steps that need to be followed. So the student athlete needs to be seen by a primary care physician. And then we need that signed note from the primary care physician on recommendations for return to play protocol. And there's a variety of ways that you will receive a physician note. Some might just say it's a blanket two weeks. Others might be more specific in the return to play um, steps that they want their uh, patient to take. 
Final clearance for participation is determined by the athletic trainer after the return to play protocol has been completed. So even if a doctor says, okay, he's all set to come back on, on June 22nd, they would still need to complete that return to play protocol. And I'll explain what that is in just a second so that they can get back on the playing field or on the court as quickly but as safely as possible. So this is what a typical return to play protocol looks like. The student athlete needs to be asymptomatic for about 48 hours prior to beginning any return to play protocol. And it first starts with light aerobic activity, walking, light jogging, but no resistance training. So they're not gonna be lifting any weights at all. Then you move to sports specific training, stretching, agility work, sprinting, but there's no equipment and there's no contact. Then you go to light contact. So you would resume light body contact drills, limit direct shots to the head contact, and light resistance training. So they might be able to go into weight room and do some of the weightlifting uh, routine, but it's light. It's not full, uh, full throttle. Then we have full contact, which is the next step. So they're fully participating in a practice, all areas, sprinting, they're in the weight room, uh, participating in all the activities that they need to participate in, and they are resistance training in full. And then the last step is game play. So that's typically what a return to play protocol is gonna look like for a student athlete when they're coming back from a concussion. Here's some concussion data over the past few years. These are Algonquin Regional High School sport-related concussions. In the 13-14 school year, we had 27 concussions. In the 14-15 school year, there were 38. In the 15-16 school year, there were 37. In this past school year, the 16-7 school year, we had 24 sport-related concussions. Impact testing. So this year, we were excited to add a, new, uh, a tool to the toolbox to help with concussion management for student athletes and for their parents and guardians. What is impact testing? Everybody hears about it, they might not know exactly what it stands for. It's immediate post-concussion assessment and cognitive testing. So it's a non-invasive test, it's set up like a video game, it takes about 20 minutes for, for anybody to go through and complete the test. It tracks information, reaction time, speed, memory, concentration, and the best way to say it is it's like a preseason physical for your brain. Some frequently asked questions that come up with impact testing that have come up this year as well. Is impact testing mandatory at Algonquin? Absolutely not. We don't make it mandatory, but we do try to educate on the value of the baseline testing and encourage participation. It's a very valuable tool uh, for use between families and their, pair, uh, and their primary care physicians. Is it necessary in order to participate in athletics at Algonquin? It's not, but um, is a district we're pleased to offer that tool. What are the responsibilities of the parent guardian? The parent guardian should ensure that the student athlete takes the test according to the instructions. Who sees those test results? They're not viewed or interpreted by any school personnel. They are for the parent guardian, the student athlete, and their primary care physician. How do I access the impact test? Upon written request from parents and guardians and per request of a health care provider, a copy of the results will be provided. They need to contact the athletic trainer at Algonquin Regional High School for a copy of the results. So those are some of the questions that have come up regarding impact testing. Here's some more data for the 2016-17 school year. This year we had 252 student athletes complete the impact <coughs> testing. In the fall, when we ran it as a pilot, we had 246 student athletes participate in it. In the winter, we had four who took it, and in the spring, we had two who took it. But don't be fooled by those numbers in the winter and the spring. 163 played multiple sports. So if they took it in the fall, if they were taking it for football in the fall, you might find that they were a wrestler in the winter or played lacrosse in the spring. So 163 of all of those uh, played more than one sport. Like I said, 24 sport-related concussions here at Algonquin this year for the 16-17 school year. Here's how it broke down for concussions. In the fall, there were 11 total concussions. Of the 11, eight took the impact test, three did not. In the winter, there were seven total concussions, seven did not take the impact test. In the spring, there were six total concussions, one took the impact test in a fall sport, five did not take the impact te test. And what you'll find of some of the student athletes who didn't take the test, those were your non-high contact sports. These are what we consider our high contact sports here at Algonquin. Football, soccer, cheer, basketball, wrestling, gymnastics, ice hockey, ski, 
baseball, softball, lacrosse, and rugby. So those would be considered your high contact sports. I spent some time speaking with some of the um, people at the MIAA to get a little bit more information about impact across the state and how schools are using it. So the MIAA got behind um, the impact testing this year and we're supporters of impact testing as a great tool to be used for, <coughs> for parents and guardians and student athletes. This year alone, 150 schools signed up with impact for the 2016-17 school year. In total, right now across the state, there are 256 schools that are using impact testing as a concussion management tool. There are additional schools beyond those 256, but they use it through a third party venue. So they might use it, they might have their student athletes uh, go to um, a hospital to take the impact testing there. So 256 specific school districts have it. Beyond that, there are more that use it through a third party. I've also spoken to a variety of schools across the state on, on how they utilize impact testing, kind of how they implement, implement it. Some schools make it mandatory for all their student athletes yearly. Some make it mandatory for the athletes twice in the four years, uh, in their four years of high school. Some make it mandatory for high impact sports only, and some are completely voluntary. And there's no right or wrong answer on it, it's just how the schools want to best utilize that uh, impact testing and provide for their student athletes and their parents or guardians. But those are some of the ways in which the schools use it. How impactive, now we love this tool. We want this tool, uh, we want parents and guardians to know how great this tool is. How can we get this information out to them so that they are aware of the benefits of this tool? So we have athletic nights with parents and guardians and student athletes. We'll be having three this year. We typically have two, but we want to bump it to three so that we can provide the opportunity for more information in each of the three seasons. So we'll have a fall athletic night, a winter athletic night, and a spring athletic night. We also talked about providing some information at freshman orientation for those uh, parents of incoming ninth graders. APTO newsletter was another way that we could uh, send out information on the benefits of impact testing. And then on top of that, some specific program talks with the athletic trainer and student athletes, the one-on-one -on -one with each of the programs about the benefits of impact testing and how important it is, how con uh, important concussion management is. And then online resources through the web website, working with Julie Doyle on uh, providing the best online resources about uh, and information on concussion management and impact testing. So that's how we're looking to communicate it for the upcoming school year. Specifically, here are the dates that we're looking at for the upcoming year for uh, providing that information. So freshman orientation, August 23rd. Fall athletic night is slated for September 5th in the auditorium. Winter athletic night, December 4th. And spring athletic night, March 27th. So right there are four ways in which we're going to try and provide information on impact testing and concussion management. And I think that's it on information on impact and concussion. I'd be happy to answer any questions about that, and then I'd like to provide you with some information on spring athletics. Kathy. Um, so, I, um, so my two boys that play football, they actually took it. Because <coughs> um, for whatever reason, she didn't have the code. Can I, just as a suggestion, when you go to the winter, the nights, the sport nights, I think it would be really helpful to have the sheet that has a code on it so parents can take them because they were in the athletic office mm -hmm. and you know when you're running in and running out and stuff like that you're not going to necessarily come to your office and your kids not going to remember absolutely <laughs> absolutely you know what i mean like it's going to be hidden someplace so if you can have those available for parents to take with them i think that especially you know in the high impact sports it'd be great to have more kids take them so if we think this is so great and other schools make it mandatory, why don't we just make it mandatory? It's, it's something that we could definitely consider as a committee. We've worked on it with the um, Health and Wellness Committee about ways to continue to evolve it as a tool that we use it here at Algonquin. So that is definitely something that we can talk about with the Health and Wellness Committee. Um, as we've discussed uh, when this was rolled out, we actually had um, I think some language from, I, I don't know where it came from, but what we did was send it to council as we normally would. And the way that it was initially written prior to the um, 
first introduction, if you will, to the parent community, suggested that the district had a higher level of responsibility than we actually do in this testing process. And so it was at that time that council recommended that we move forward with it. We modify the language and that, in fact, we did not want to make it mandatory based on what he perceived as um, an expectation that the district had a higher responsibility um, in terms of the testing process and what was going to happen with the results. And so at that point, based on where we were in September uh, and the launch, it was suggested that we not. Um, we can certainly revisit that now that we have some, you know, definitely um, refined practices. Um, no, I think we also plan. have to have a plan, which we didn't have, which is if we say it's mandatory and they don't take it, does that mean the child doesn't play? What's the consequence, right? So I think that now we have time to be able to think about this a little bit more carefully, revise that fill the gaps that were, were there when this was first introduced, and then come back with that. Oh, I al also, there's some number of known schools that make it mandatory already. Right. To find out what their experiences are, what their attorneys have We actually the used their language. I think it was Shrewsbury that right. Kara right. gave, and our council said we don't, you Do know, gave some suggestions. Do those schools make it mandatory for all sports or just for certain sports? So I've come across both. Some do it for the high-contact sports, and some do it for all. Uh, I have a suggestion uh, just when you, uh, on the slide that you said communicate to parents. I think another organization, another way it means would be through the booster organization. Absolutely. You know, so I think that's, you know, you're trying to hit as many parents as you can. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a great way. My question was <coughs> where and how is this administered? You were talking about a code. So, so did they so do it at home? home? So the kids come home with a code and they go up on a computer and you take a test. So it's a computer test. So they ask you the same question, I think, a few times. Maybe word a little bit differently, but they have different multiple answers. Mm -hmm. And so that's their baseline. So if they, in my case, I've not had concussions, but I believe if you have concussions, you go back and take the same test again. If your health care provider asks for a repeat right. test, you can do a repeat test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, my, and my pediatrician suggested that they take it because they were playing hockey, you know, forever. And then I never had them do it, but the football I did. And then my other follow-up, nothing did, on, onto the subject, but nothing on your slides. You had that, there was a high level of students that had concussions. So those were reported to you, but do you have communication with their teachers? Because I know those students have, you know, concussions, they cannot be reading anything, they can't have any technology, so I want to know how is that put into their schoolwork so they are not affected? Do you have communication with their Actually, that's communicated through the health department. So that would be Sherry Karen and Justine Fishman who send that out. It is a conversation or it is the athletic trainer, the athletic director of the health department are all involved in knowing if that there is a concussion going on, where they are at in the process. But it is the health department that sends out the email to the teachers letting them know that they might have restrictions on, you know, they might be in for half days or they might be able, whatever the restriction is that they put in there. But that is sent out from the health department. And is that a report that you also see? So I am also included on that email that, that is sent out to those teachers, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, move on. I, I do want to give a shout out to the health and wellness department. They worked very closely on this language, as well as uh, Jonathan Drisco, the athletic trainer. When we initially, uh, there was a start and then we, re we pulled it back and then we started again to do a, a more fully um, in-depth implementation. And they spent a lot of time working on this language and working on you know, how this was gonna be presented to the community initially. So um, I think they, they had a tremendous insightful uh, insight and added um, a wealth of experience and knowledge to the overall conversation. And Lori Pardee as well. Okay, thank you. Spring athletics. So I would like to provide you an update on spring uh, athletics as well. I know that the hour is late, but I'd like to give you some information. Um, oh, just to give you an update on how, about, how have our teams fared uh, at the end of the spring season. So our baseball team advanced to the sectional quarterfinal. Our boys lacrosse team advanced to the sectional quarterfinal. 
our girls lacrosse advanced to the sectional semifinal. Uh, the sem uh, lacrosse has changed so that um, the sectional semifinals up until the finals are at the uh, higher seed. So they no longer play at neutral sites for the semifinals, which is unfortunate. So they took the long trek out to Longmeadow this year for the girls and the boys did as well. Our unified track team finished second at the sectional meet. Our boys volleyball team advanced to the sectional semifinals. Our girls rugby team advanced to the state finals. It was an excellent game up at Endicott College. It was a showcase for rugby as the first state championship in the state of Massachusetts and in the country. And our girls rugby team was a part of it. So that's history making right there. And it, boy, was it fun to watch. Um, our boys rugby team advanced to the uh, state semifinals. Our girls tennis team advanced to the sectional quarterfinals, and our boys tennis team advanced to the sectional finals. And a specific congratulations to Ryan Farhart and Christian Jorgensen. They finished as uh, central sectional champions in the, uh, as do a doubles teams in the individual uh, MIA tournament. So they had a tremendous year uh, in the individual tournament. So as you can see, our teams performed really well this spring. Uh, we had 30 mid-watch all-stars this spring. We had nine, now rugby doesn't fall under the mid-watch, so we had nine rugby all-stars between the boys and the girls, and 12 of our student athletes uh, finished as T&G all-stars, which is good. 21 of our student athletes um, made it to the Central West Championship meet for track. So those are some of our all-star numbers. Um, and tomorrow night I'll be attending is the first ever Best of Home Team All-Star Banquet. It's put on by the Telegram and Gazette. So anybody in the 2016-17 school year who is either an honorable mention or made first team All-Star for the Telegram and Gazette was invited to this banquet. So we have 57 student athletes from fall, winter, and spring athletics who were either first team or honorable mention who will be attending that banquet tomorrow night at the DCU Center. Uh, Pedro Martinez is gonna be the guest speaker awesome. there tomorrow night. So awesome. it's, it's outstanding. We are extremely well represented nice there. So that's gonna be a fun night tomorrow night with all those kids. Um, Joan, I know you had asked about intramurals. I just wanted to provide you an update on okay. that, on what Thank was you. offered as intramurals this year. So tennis was offered, wiffle ball was offered, um, indoor soccer, but the one that all of the kids was drawn, uh, were drawn to was ultimate frisbee. So that ran in both the fall and in the spring, and they had about 30 participants in the fall and just about the same amount in the spring as well. So that was the popular um, intramural event for the school year. Yes. Um, I know, uh, Kathleen, you had asked about student athletes who are going on to participate at the next level. And if you bear with me, I just want to share with you where some of our athletes are going to be going next year. Uh, so football, we have a, a, a very large number of student athletes playing. So Jack Derulskis is going to WPI to play. Nathan Cooley, Hobart College. Joe Vensel, Endicott. Colin Robinson, Western New England. Brett Sherman, Endicott. Ryan Barry, Lake Forest. Nick Morrill, Ohio Wesleyan. And uh, Max Sarasoli, Bridgeton Academy. All of those student athletes are going on to play um, football at the college level. For boys soccer, we have Sebastian Royal playing at WPI. Wrestling, Bryce Finnegan is going to Springfield. For cheer, Molly O'Driscoll is going to Syracuse. Samantha Brazio is going to UMass Amherst. And uh, Kylie Eckler is going to the University of Delaware for cheer. For girls soccer, Kate Hossage is going to Syracuse. Meg Stassi is going to South Carolina Upstate, and Mackenzie Smith is going to Brandeis. For baseball, Andrew Tache is going to Southern New Hampshire University, and Cam Brooks is going to Colby Sawyer. And then for rugby, Matt Paglia is going to be playing at Providence College, Cole Mislanka at New Haven, and then Nate Porteous at UVM. So that's uh, uh, an update on where some of our student athletes are going to be uh, participating in athletics beyond high school. Um, <clears throat> so that is some of the information on spring athletics. As you can see, it has been a tremendous year for our student athletes. Oh, one more thing I did want to share. We had 12, um, 12 of our seniors earn the T-Hawk um, 12 season student athlete award. So there are 12 kids who participated in all 12 seasons here at Algonquin, which is outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, that's truly, you know, a commitment to academics and athletics. So, so that's some information on spring athletics. <coughs> okay, that is a lot of information. No. <laughs> um, I had a, a question on, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And, um, brain dead. Um, I need that impact it, test. Yeah. <laughs> I failed. I failed. I'm sure. No. A suggestion um, through the chair when you talk with Christine. I know in the past we have had um, the numbers of the students for the fall, winter, and spring mm -hmm. and intramurals. Mm -hmm. And it was a breakdown by the sports and number of the students that are Absolutely. in it. I can so I can't request it, but I'll ask the chair through. Through the chair to ask Christine. <laughs> okay. <coughs> That's next year. Okay. And um, I wanted to also know um, that uh, through the um, principal's report, not the report, uh, the school improvement plan, he mentioned that there was a thousand dollar grant that was through Special Olympics that was given to the unified team. Do you know? what that was used for and how that helped the program. So they wanted to know if they could use it for uniforms and absolutely that was something that uh, it was under the grant that it fell into that they could use it for. So I think they were uh, pursuing uniforms with that grant. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I think the last question that we had outstanding from the last meeting was, um, I think there needed to be some clarification about the uniforms, that there was still money left over in the uniform budget, mm -hmm. and sort of like how that happens, what the process is, and you know, why there might be money still left over back, you know, in May. So here are the teams uh, that had uh, subsidized funding from, from the uh, budget this year. Girls cross country and track, boys soccer, uh, girls across, girls rugby, and boys rugby. So. Each of those, all of the teams were set up on a rotation on how old are the uniforms based upon uh, booster information and how um, uniforms had been purchased because up until recently all uniforms were fundraised through boosters and purchased through boosters. So um, going back and checking everything out and how old are the uniforms and how long have you had them, we set up a rotation on the most needed uniforms. And usually you're looking at a five year rotation. That's pretty much the length of what your uniform is going to be. So based on that, we set up a rotation among all the sports programs. And this year, those are the teams that um, had uh, money that were put towards their uniforms. Okay. So the fact that there was money in the So there's, budget there's is not even that, close to that amount at this point right now, after all the transactions have gone through. Right. It was so, just a, an accounting yes, kind yes. of it, lag. Let's put it that lag. Joan? Because yeah, my question was, if the... If the $1,000 grant from Special Olympics went for the uniforms, why didn't we buy the uniforms? So they weren't sure they were going to go with the uniforms. They had, they had not decided what they wanted to do. So that was, you know, that was a conversation with Spisha and Ken on, on how do you want to do it? Can we get uniforms if we want? So they, that's the route they were going, but the, not that that has happened yet. So. Okay. All right. And then I just have one other question that came back. Um, we used to have a student athletic council. Mm -hmm. um, is that still in place? I haven't heard anything about it, but I don't have any students here at this district. Anymore. So I've done it as a captain's council with our meetings that start up in the fall. With the big one, we have one uh, it, this year. It's coming up on August 22nd, so we have a captain's council. So a little bit different terminology, but relatively the same thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? And thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to What? I said thank you. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to make a motion. I'm like, there's no motion to be made. <laughs> I, I can make a motion on the next item if you like. Yes, you can. Let's read what it is first, shall we? Uh, the next item on the agenda is to ratify the agreement with the Algonquin Regional High School Custodians and Algonquin Regional Teachers Association Unit C Educational Support Professionals. So if I could, I move that because these uh, contracts comply with guidelines provided by both towns to us and because they are also similar to the other contract that we negotiated with the teachers union this year at a 2% cost of living adjustment for, for these two groups of people, I vote that we ratify the agreements that we have uh, reviewed in executive session with the Algonquin Regional High School Custodians and the Algonquin Regional Teachers Association Unit C Educational Support Professionals. Whoa. Okay. Moved by Paul. Second. Seconded by Lynn. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Good job. Next is the 2017-18 subcommittee assignments. 
The information is in your packet regarding the assignment. I think there will be some modifications to different committees and maybe some reactivation of others. I'm trying to talk as fast as possible. Generally speaking, I think uh, it's gone one way or the other where people submit their request to the chair. There um, is a request that I would, I would have that we do um, solicit input on the policy subcommittee. The intent is for our three policy subcommittees and maybe a fourth to combine to convene this summer to get a jump start on the year. Um, it's oftentimes difficult to plan that during the school year and people have busy lives and to really try to get ahead of the policies. Uh, that will give us time to submit them to council for review and then really make some, get some closure through the school year by meeting maybe three times instead of an hour here or there. Lynn. Um, I just have a, a question. So every time so we when we have the subcommittee meetings and we're trying to set it up mm -hmm. does that doodle poll go to all the school committee members or just the members of the particular subcommittee like to start it go it, it is one or the other we've had occasion to send it out to everyone if we haven't gotten a uh, response a timely response or enough response from the liaisons because sometimes we keep an eye over that um, because we have had difficulty in getting some quorums because everyone has busy schedules. We've um, of late sent it out to everyone. And what we try to do is really select the um, significant numbers of people who are actually assigned to the committee on a particular day. And, and sometimes it works out really well and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and that's why I'm hopeful if we give enough notice and we are planful, like doing a summer and then moving from there, that we might be able to get capture the committee the liaisons that are assigned to the committee certainly first and foremost okay so, yeah and you know, we, we I, tended not to send it out to the entire committee unless we didn't get a lot of response back from the members of the subcommittee because of time okay so basically the people that are on the subcommittee their responses are are looked at first to try to, to try set to up get a meeting that and if you can't then you'll go to the other yeah because I was just if it goes out to everyone I know we have everyone's a subcommittee um, alternate mm -hmm. but if we send it out to all the members and it's equal billing then it's like everyone's a subcommittee member right. too so I I sort of didn't want us to be crossing that <coughs> line and we generally don't unless we don't either get unless, a timely yeah. response or we don't see a quorum and then we say okay we've got to open this up to everybody yeah. and most of the time it works really well like that and once in a while it doesn't so yeah. that's okay. what we've been trying to do but thank you for that because we will certainly make sure we keep up with that practice. And Kathleen, yes. uh, when would you like these, our requests to be sent to you by? Um, so uh, there's a bunch mm -hmm. of openings. Um, and I think we do need to get the three policy payroll and warrants. Policy payroll and warrants and, um, and I would actually also like operational budget subcommittee yes. uh, so that we could meet over the summer. So policy payroll, operational budget, and what was the third? I think I combined. Oh, you got payroll and warrants. Okay, so policy, payroll, and operational budget. And actually, if everybody <laughs> wants to stay on them, we're okay with policy and payroll, and we just have one opening on budget, mm -hmm. if everyone wants to stay. Yeah, I'll stay on the ones I'm on. And um, I'll stay on mine. So what, for the new members, what we um, typically do is we try to balance North Row and South Row. And, um, but I don't see why we need to limit it. No. So if you want to be involved, feel free to, to um, volunteer. Mm -hmm. So we will look for, unless Mrs. Frank, wants to be on <laughs> operational budget. <laughs> I, due to my like new unemployed status, unemployed status uh -huh. <laughs> is being retired, I think I will go off operational because we may be traveling or going to Arizona in the winter. Oh, so you're going to leave. Oh, oh. darn it. Okay. All right, now <laughs> Are you going to invite us? Can we have our meeting yeah. there in like February? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll really? stay. <laughs> <laughs> I have lodging. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, that only has affected operational budget. Okay, um, at least for the summer. Right. Uh, all right. So when do I want them? You know, as soon as possible. I mean, for the new members, I want to give them you know sort of time to understand what 
the different subcommittees are, but I'm still going to say let's do September. <laughs> so think about it over the summer. If you have questions, feel free to call any of us, either any of us on the school committee or anybody in the district, and um, we will uh, answer any questions that you have. In the policy, yes. we still have a form. We have three of the four if the current member is on. If no one else signed up over the summer. Right. Oh, I forgot about this one. Okay. And we have a working subcommittee, uh, operational budget subcommittee, that has met and prepared documents in preparation of the operational budget subcommittee. So I would assume the working group can meet. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So as soon as possible, preferably September. What? Cheryl. So I, I think that we need a couple of more volunteers for payroll. Oh, warrant that's right. Over yes, the we summer. do. Mm -hmm. Please. We do. So. Um, yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, what, what is that? Like, what do you guys do? Time. You go to the central office and you sign payroll yeah. like you sign warrants. Which you do you as know, an I mean, honestly, like, I think I do that every week. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. So just put me on there. It's just for the Thank summer. Are we all backups? Yeah, we are all backups. So, um, I, get the phone. I think we're trying to identify <laughs> who's around during the Can summer. Come in? Right. Um, Are you around? I'm around. Mr. Southboro? Yeah, I'm just picking on you because sure. your Southboro and Southboro is easiest to get to central office. <laughs> yeah. So we will put, around. yeah. We'll put, not here, we could put Oh, Mr. Committee. Desmond. We're putting Mr. <laughs> Desmond on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He's good. You can backfill him. Price to pay for that. <laughs> That's right. You're not here. Be careful. All right. Is that Thank enough you. for? Thank you. That's great. Right. Thank you. Your um, summer requirement. Okay. So September. Let's get these, uh, your, Requested assignments to by. Update on the principal search. Well, by now I think everyone knows that Tom is retiring. Um, we thought if we had this meeting till midnight, he'd stay, but <laughs> it's not going to work out that way. And um, we have um, appointed Sarah Prabuski Walsh. Dr. Walsh has been out and about around the campus quite often, has participated in an all day site visit where um, a number of committee members were present, if not all. And uh, most recently, last night, was another meet and greet. I know she's met with Mr. Mead. She's participated in interviews. And um, I think we're off to a rousing um, and very exciting um, start or ending, uh, beginning somewhere in process. It's exciting. And um, we also uh, have been interviewing for assistant principals. We had. Um, seven interviews this week, I think, and um, it was a full day, and thanks to the people, the teachers who served on that, and a very, um, uh, possibly a future senator, a member of the freshman class served on that committee <laughs> as well, Mr. Green, and um, <laughs> two finalists were brought to my, to my office, and we have conducted interviews, and I'm hopeful that uh, we will have an announcement very soon. Okay. Oh, excellent. So we are, um, in good shape at, mm -hmm. this, at this point. Okay, then uh, moving on to superintendent's report to the committee, principal's report. Yes. 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 Um, briefly, I can go through this. Chi <laughs> um, Chi. <laughs> uh, the aforementioned NISPAC awards night. Um, those are our recipients from uh, Algonquin. You can see listed there. Um, also, a um, special kind of event that we had due to um, uh, scheduling conflicts um, for the uh, Special Olympics that's usually held at Bowditch Field in Framingham. Um, we couldn't make that as a, as a district, so on June 8th, ARHS, the Algonquin um, campus hosted the K-12 Algonquin Games. So that was run by um, Frank Nellenbach, who's an adaptive uh, phys ed teacher itinerant uh, in the district. And <coughs> he did a very nice job. Um, we got good cooperation from our staff, of course. Um, I mentioned science and, and math career days. Um, the Jean Arethusic Memorial Portrait was unveiled um, in, a, in a very nice ceremony on June 7th. Uh, family and friends of Jean gathered in the World Language Alcove for the unveiling of her portrait, which was done by George Hansen, who's a, a staff member here. There's a picture of a picture there, if you can see that. Um, it's our superintendent on the left. But the picture you can see through <laughs> um, by George uh, Hansen. Um, it's uh, 
obviously on display and um, commemorating Jean's many years of great service to our school um, in the um, World Language Department and beyond. Um, Global Issues Awareness Week. Um, I know you'll have time after this meeting um, to look at the, some of the posters over here, but I'm just showing you where they are. Flashlights, Tom. Flashlights <laughs> will be provided. Uh, miners' helmets if we need it. Um, but um, this is um, part of the um, incredible event that takes place in the aftermath of AP testing, at, at least for the uh, four sections of world history. Um, Mr. Utaro, Nate Utaro, has his students um, pick a, a topic or a, a, a need that's worldwide, and it might be nutrition, it might be water, it might be um, electricity or energy, that sort of thing. Um, they're free to choose that topic, and they're free to pick their partners to work with on that, and sometimes several partners. But um, it was a fabulous night because it was the first time they ever kind of opened it up to the public, and the public, in this case, are going to be the doting mothers and fathers and, and family of all these students, and they were here um, in, in high numbers. So it was a great event right here in this library, right in this general area here. So kudos for um, the, the kids that um, participated in that and uh, also Mr. Utaro. Um, <clears throat> NEF silent auction, uh, um, she's gone now uh, to her beauty rest, but uh, Spisha Geiges um, was um, front and center as the culinary um, teacher at our school for the um, uh, Northboro Ed Foundation silent auction. Um, we had a family um, that won that, and uh, they came, uh, two young boys, um, ran around with their um, transformer trucks and um, entertained themselves during hors d'oeuvres, but uh, it was a fabulous night. The food was marvelous. The students were incredible in terms of cooking and serving and accommodating um, the, um, the family, and so that was wonderful. We did another um, silent auction, which was to participate with um, by offering a parking space uh, close into the uh, school and prime seats for the um, graduation ceremony. So um, it was fun to uh, do those two things and, and to, of course, help out the uh, Ed Foundation um, with their auction. Um, moving along crisply now, the Serenity Garden Eagle Project. There's a picture of uh, uh, an Eagle Scout um, um, with some um, waif off the street. Um, that actually uh, is a picture of two different Boy Scout Eagle projects there. The flooring of that whole thing is a brick um, circular uh, design. And then um, this year, James Rizzitano, Jay Rizzitano, um, for his Eagle project, constructed uh, six benches and um, flower pots to go with them. So it's rather nice, and it will afford a chance for a class from time to time to take a little break and uh, head outside. Um, a lot going on with the Art Honor Society, but uh, let me um, cut to the chase with a few things here. Um, uh, we have the last team standing. By June 10th, there was only one team left, and that was our girls' rugby team, and they met, as uh, Kara said, at Andacott College in the title match. They went up against Belmont High School, and they've played Belmont before. I had a conversation that was unrelated to this completely with the principal at Belmont High School this week, and I, I mentioned to him at the end of the conversation, um, congratulations to his girls team for winning. And uh, he said, the most amazing part of that whole thing was going to the breakfast the day before and being with those two teams and observing them in terms of their high regard for each other, how they got along so well together, their sportsmanship and their, and their friendship. Um, and uh, I talked to the coach about that, Emily Philbin, and she said, yeah, She's, um, she puts out the word to her um, players and says, you know, you're going to go beat each other's br brains in? Well, <laughs> maybe not. But, you know, beat each other up on the field of play, but you're going to find that their strongest friendships are forged just there. And uh, that's certainly true. And he was so complimentary of our, of our girls and how they um, interacted with his, his team, too. So that was a nice thing to hear. And... Farewell to the class of 2017. Thank you very much. That's my report. <laughs> the end of an era. Yeah. 
and just when his color photos were extraordinary. We were talking about that earlier. <laughs> right, right. I know. That's a very symbolic picture, just the back sides of the, the buses going off into the sunset. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure it's the last we'll hear from you tonight. Um, where are we? Approval of grants, approval of grants and donations, bows and boosters. So I vote that uh, I, I move that we vote to accept the uh, the bows uh, donation of twenty thousand dollars worth of uh, speakers and the boosters donation of eighteen thousand uh, dollars for supportive financial uh, you know uh, tasks that go that go with, de with uh, deploying them. Do we, or do we need to do the three thousand two or no? So just the just the just the second. Second. Okay, Paul. Uh, moved by Paul Buck, seconded by Lynn. Any questions or discussion? Paul. I mean, Bose has been terrific to us. Just terrific. Unbelievable. It should go on record. Yeah. And we thank them very very much, and we thank boosters very very much, and we thank the regional school committee budget. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, any other questions or? Comments? All right. All those in favor? All those in favor? Oh, sorry. <laughs> can I, can, oh, you have a can question? Can I ask a question? So are these both speakers, like the whole booster thing, is this for the field or is this for the auditorium? Stadium field. It is. Okay. Sorry, I'm just like, I'm reading this. That's all right. Okay. okay. Yes. Now all those in favor. Yeah. Okay. That passes unanimously. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bose and Boosters. Uh, FY17 monthly general fund expenditure report. Well, I move that we accept the monthly general fund expenditure report dated May 31, 2017 until it's audited. Second. Moved by Paul, seconded by Lynn. Any questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor? That passes unanimously. FY17 revenue report. Paul. I move that we accept the uh, Northport Southport Regional School District Statement of Revenue dated May 31, 2017 uh, until audited. I guess. Yes, until audited. Second. Moved by Paul. Seconded by Lynn. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Enrollments. Information on the enrollments are in your packet. Tom, I don't know if you uh, comment about this, but we uh, are seeing an influx of freshmen. It's early yet, so we don't know what our final numbers will be. Um, but we do know uh, from guidance, 100% uh, of the North Borough's uh, grade 8 right now are enrolled and oh. almost 90% of South Borough. Good. So uh, wow. things could shift dramatically, as we all know, between now and uh, in terms of enrollment numbers. So um, how was it, 25 students, six already enrolled? Yes. That we weren't expecting. Right. Um, we put in a, a fence in, in the borders of Northboro and Southboro for freshman students. <laughs> <laughs> And I think the wow. um, guidance reported a lot from private school deciding to come for good reasons to Algonquin. Like yeah, there's, there's, there's multiple um, um, factors that are involved in this uh, uh, higher than the normal uh, mm -hmm. amount. But I think all told, it, it reflects our, our stance in terms of mm -hmm. marketing the school. Mm -hmm. um, we think that um, our school is very competitive and um, uh, we're communicating that more broadly and, and deeply into the community uh, with good results. And one thing that we did change recently, a couple years ago, we flipped around and uh, we're, we're having our students from the middle schools come to Algonquin and to walk through the school when it's busy, when, it, when things are happening, uh, so that they can see that and they can experience, you know, what it looks like when it's live and uh, operating. So. I think that's had a profound impact on, mm -hmm. on a lot of our students. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, we certainly have the room um, for, for a, a large class, and so we're, we're looking forward to this. Joan. And I think another positive thing with, because I know that that's always a great celebrated thing when the high school kids go down to eighth grade, but like in your principal's report, I saw here that there were five ARHS EL students who went down to Z school. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I know that's happened before throughout the year. So, I mean, these kids look up at those kids and go, oh, well, I want to be like them someday. And they're, they're very impressed and admire them. So that even helps when you, not even eighth grade, but when you go down to the K to five school. So thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you. Another foot in your hat. <laughs> okay. Any other comments on enrollments? Then moving on to old business, naming subcommittee update. 
Paul did, uh, Tom did a wonderful job summarizing a very special day uh, that we had uh, unveiling the uh, portrait that George Hansen so carefully um, crafted for uh, in memory of Jean, uh, there's a, a few photos in your um, packet. There's a copy of the um, the actual dedication, um, the actual naming uh, for the world language resource um, area, and then a snapshot of the family. And it was wonderful to have so many family members present. Mm -hmm. And I um, want to give a shout out to Aaron Shreve, who is a junior, who played um, and serenaded us uh, throughout the process. Um, for I think three hours, um, two hours anyways, through the ceremony, just played his guitar. It was wonderful, <coughs> wonderful music, and volunteered his time to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a great afternoon and a really uh, celebratory culmination of a multi-year process to make this happen. So thank you, Tom, and, and the naming committee, for sure. And the parents send their appreciation to the committee and to the naming committee for all of their work in remembering, helping to remember Jim. Yeah, it was our treasure. And uh, just, uh, we, I think we alluded to this, but we also had a wonderful uh, Mass Fallen Heroes event here at the high school, and the Arsenal family attended. Lindsay um, is, a, is quite a powerful speaker, uh, not only for uh, what Memorial Day, Day is really about, but also to um, thoughtfully remember her brother. And we had an opportunity at that point, while not the full ceremony, but to uh, introduce attendees to the Brian Austin Outway, which will be um, named in a, at another time in a, another ceremony, probably mm -hmm. in the fall. So it was just a great, a great ceremony. And Kathy, you were there. It was nice. Yeah. And the hockey team was there with their um, camo right. shirts on. Right. Mm -hmm. It was nice. nice. It was very nice. Very nice. Done? Done. Okay. Uh, policy development and distribution, non audience sharing. None. Actually, it's poetry of an edge. Should we put it on the minutes? Should we approve minutes first? You know, can I move that we move the action on the minutes till next meeting? Do do we need them? Oh, we need them. Tell Cheryl. Yeah, that's okay. No, that's fine. I know, but she's not no, Cheryl. Like <laughs> but does she have to reprint all that paper again? Yeah. We'll just bring it back. Um, yeah, so no, no, that we were trying to get them done at the end of the year, so we didn't have to revisit one year again in the next. Paul can do it in one motion. Can we just right, we'll do it in one motion? We'll, we'll do it in one, one motion. motion. Right. Okay, let's, yeah, Paul let's can move do it. that to now. All the executive sessions, so it doesn't matter. There's nothing that's being okay. talked about. I reviewed them all. So would you like me to? Go. We'll head up to there. So I I uh, move that we vote to. Um, accept the open meeting minutes of May 17th, 2017, that we ex approve and release the executive session minutes of May 17th, 2017, that we vote to release the retained executive session minutes, and we vote to approve and release the subcommittee minutes that are all attached in your packets. Second. Moved by Paul, seconded by so many people. <laughs> <laughs> Sec seconded by Lynn. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? That passes unanimously. All right. All right. I thought we were going to the other passes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to move audience sharing to the end. So personnel, distribution of personnel report is in your packet. Communications, distribution of the harbinger in your packet. Approval of bills and payrolls, always. Agenda items for next year. Right. Um, anybody have any suggestions? You have committee assignments, right? Yeah. Right, committee assignments. Uh, have freshman orientation which. Okay, freshman orientation. The uh, search for assistant principals and mm -hmm. IT directors. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, how no, they, would it be sort of combined? How the um, summer program in special ed was? Summer programming. Well, maybe it's a change. Update. No, that'll be at combined. Okay. Give me a second. We'll have to combine. Um, okay. So then, let's go to audience sharing. All right. Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> we're also oh, audience, we're audience members. members. <laughs> so, Tom, you have a special presentation uh, in recognition of, it, you know, if they would stop retiring, we'd be all fine. We'd be out of here by now, but we're not, and neither is Mr. Mead. And so we do have a special um, 
certificate of recognition from our very own House of Representatives. And I'm not sure, um, even Joan? time of year and she wouldn't be here at 11 o'clock at night anyway <laughs> but it says the Commonwealth of Massachusetts the House of Representatives be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Thomas Mead in recognition of your dedicated service to the towns of Northborough and Southborough and Northborough as principal of the Algonquin Regional High School the entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. Given this 21st day of June 2017 and signed by Robert DeLeo, Speaker of the House, and offered by Carolyn Dykema, State Representative. And I will shake your hand in her place. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Any other audience sharing? Is there any other? I mean, I'll share. Of um, although it's so much better to share after you've had the cupcake in your hand. <laughs> But um, just thank you, Mr. Mead, for, I mean, I have never known another principal of the high school, so you are Algonquin Regional High School to me. And um, instead of going through, you know, a long farewell speech, I will just say that I think the, um, I think what says it all is, all anybody has to do is look at your face when you talk about the kids, mm -hmm. when you talk about their, you know, accomplishments, and, you know, even just their walk in the halls. It, that is the testament to what um, you have brought to Algonquin, what the kids feel and you know have felt ever since you ever since you arrived. What we have all acknowledged, and um, thank you very much for bringing that to Algonquin, and bringing Algonquin to the wonderful place that it is right now. Thank you, Kathleen. I I, I really appreciate um, that. It's um it's been a, a very very gratifying experience for me. Um, and a highlight of, of my career in education. So I, uh, I am endlessly thankful to the towns of Northboro and Southboro, um, the parents who send their wonderful children to our school, and uh, you know, my staff and, and teachers who do such a wonderful job of, of helping them to grow and mature. Lynn. Um, actually, um, uh, you were, my son was a senior when you was your first year. And it was just noticeably different, like mm -hmm. the kids, and I was at that first graduation and I'd never seen a, a graduating class give a pr principal a standing ovation. Um, and you just like walk the halls and just, and you know, the school spirit um, prior to you coming was, I don't know, if, I mean, it, it, it was just, it, the, the kids were kind of in the transition from the new school opening and right. and um, the construction <laughs> completing and and that senior class had lived a little bit um, through some of the construction and the closures and things like that. So there was a lot of different theories of why the school spirit wasn't, you know, what my son expected it would be and it really has has changed and I, I it has to do with your leadership you know your your personality is so upbeat and attending every single you know event um, well, not, that the kids well, well <laughs> I mean you set the standard I think the first year you definitely were at everyone <laughs> But um, that people just assume that you were there, so don't <laughs> give up the secret. Everyone thinks you were there. So you just um, passed out blue blazers to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> after a while, but you definitely were there and a presence in the kids' lives and showed a great interest in you know what they were doing, you know, outside of the classroom as well as 
in the school, you know, outside of school as well as in the school. So, um, and I think that you've set the stage ready for the for um, our new principal, and she's, you know, she's got a great um, situation that she's walking in with, and um, and I thank you for that. John. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I like to say that I agree with Lynn. I think the atmosphere and the climate of this community has changed dramatically since you took the leadership. And for that, you will be, you have left your mark and you'll never be forgotten here in the halls of Algonquin. Uh, mainly from even the teachers that you hired. You, had, you saw the positives and you saw what they were going to do and the type of leaders they would be and you selected great people so your legacy will live through them. I had the honor of graduation of meeting your wife, very lovely lady, of course, what would we expect? And I, I was happy to hear that, you know, after your next couple of weeks, you're going to be taking a bicycling tour through Europe, is that correct? That's right, that's right. Wow. Yeah. And you, yeah, so we will expect to see you uh, at the Tour de France. <laughs> 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 Hope you can make it up those, uh, the Alps. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful, and your wife was just very charming, and she's so proud of you, as we are. So you will be sorely missed, but you've left your mark. You're always here. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. So I'll, just, I'll keep it short and sweet. Thank you so much for all of your service, and, uh, and I hope that you enjoy your retirement and come back and visit. Your presence is noticed a lot. I notice your presence a lot. You know, like she says, that not just in classrooms, but you know, outside of the classrooms, whether it be the kids' activities or sports or whatever. So it's nice to see. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, and just, you know, I mean, piling on here. I mean, you've been just <laughs> terrific. You've been a delight to work with. Uh, it's, it's noticeable in the, in the department chairs when they make their presentations. And, you know, I, I go back far enough that, you know, I'm, I'm like Joan, I can kind of attest to the fact that you know, it's, it's terrific, and, you know, that's, that all started when you arrived. Congrats on that. You built a terrific engine out there. It's working, firing on all cylinders. Nice job. Nice job. Enjoy your retirement, is right. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Now I want to retire. Hiking <laughs> 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 the Alps. That's what I want to do. No recognition of the work that you've done would be quite complete, just made without cupcakes. Can <laughs> <laughs> so. we adjourn? I mean, we adjourn <laughs> this meeting of the Algonquin uh, No Persona Leaders Meeting. Second. Moved by Paul Buckus, I heard by Lynn. All those in favor. Unanimous. Have a great summer, everybody.